Hi, welcome to Animalia the Podcast. I'm Natasha, and thank you so much for tuning in. On this episode of Animalia, I speak with an attorney whose last resort was to settle a matter in court. And that's not even how she wanted it to go. The underlying point of this conversation is to highlight how far removed from the reality of the citizens who are faced with breaches of the said law. When law enforcement and elected officials appear to be unwilling to intervene, where do we turn? I hope you learn something from this very interesting conversation around the Dog Control Act. So please welcome to Animalia, Amy Khan. Welcome to Animalia, Miss Amy Khan. She's an attorney at law. And I want to start by asking Amy a little bit about herself. Could you tell us about your life growing up with animals? Sure. So I grew up, all my life, I lived in a townhouse type of community. So we weren't actually allowed to have a wide variety of pets. So my experience of animals was always that of begging my mom if we can have a dog and her always saying no. (laughs) But it never stopped me and my siblings from loving animals and always looking forward to going by my cousins or my friends that have dogs or cats and um, just generally enjoying being around them. Um, And then when we were around maybe just around 10 years old we went to Mayaru and there was a stray dog of course those are the ones that always get our hearts going the fastest yes yes and we could not leave him so we had our very own dog for 10 years and well I think all pet stories tend to end in heartbreak (laughs) because Mm. even though you could have them for 10 years or 100 years saying goodbye is probably the hardest thing you'll ever have to do oh yes so we in 2018 we unfortunately had to say goodbye to our dog but you know that love that you knew and experienced from animals i mean it's something that never really leaves you I think we can justify making ourselves better people than we are (laughs) when animals are involved. But that's probably just me. That's a very good point. And in fact, it does give us a a kind of a sense of superiority that we can extend our hearts and and minds and homes to include animals as members of the family, not just as, you know, pets, but really as members of our family. Of course. So... You reached out to me some time ago to ask my advice on a particular issue that you were having. Could you describe to us what that situation involves up until the point where you contacted me? You could stop there and then we'll discuss. (laughs) Okay, sure. So in September, like around September last year, one of the units in my community was rented out to, um, to an individual and they came with their a small dog like a little um like a mixed poodle sort of mini dog and they also came with a pit bull so i think i don't really know how they intended to keep that a secret for too long because our houses are i mean i share a wall on either side with my neighbors so we're very close and um it was a pit bull an american pit bull terrier so i had a problem with it because i just felt as though you can't allow this to happen where somebody brings a dog a not just not just a dangerous dog right because i i understand the balance with breed discrimination and everything but 
a large breed dog that will obviously bark louder than a small dog. They will have more needs than a small dog and they will get more agitated being in a very small space. So I brought up the issue with the um, management committee of the co of the company that controls where, where I live. And they said, okay, yeah, we agree that we can't allow the person to keep the dog here. So, of course, I mean, we were really reasonable and we asked if she would kindly find a place to relocate her dog. And we didn't ask them to do it today for tomorrow sort of thing. You know, we were giving them sufficient time because we understand that, you know, you want to find a loving place, a safe place to relocate your animal to. But some dog owners, I... And the compound does allow pets, yes? Yes. So you are allowed to have a pet with written permission from the company. However, okay. I mean, there are stipulations to that. I mean, you can't, you can't have over a certain number of dogs. You can't have certain, um, like, over a certain weight category and things like that. Okay. It's that detailed. I think it has to be in order to have some type of predictability to what you will allow in and not. Yes. But <laughs> so when I, well, when not, well, not me directly, but when the dog owner, because I, I would prefer to just refer to the person as the dog owner from now, um, when they were initially contacted to relocate the dog, that was met with hostility and opposition that on an unprecedented level, I, I think. And um, we sort of just realized that it would be an impossible thing, like that they were not going to remove the dog at all. And, and what was the argument that she was using in terms of, was she arguing that, you know, I'm allowed to have this dog or that I can't find anywhere to put her or that, you're discriminating against me because of the dog. What was what was her response to the other residents, you know, asking her to, to remove the dog? Well, you see, if there was some sort of reasonable explanation, then I think we would have been open to speak amicably and negotiate with this person. However, the dog owner's argument was that she is paying money to live here so that she's entitled to have her pet and that we cannot tell her anything at all. Uh -huh. okay. So I, <laughs> being a lawyer, of course, the first thing I did was I went to my lease agreement. And of course, the lease agreement showed very clearly that you are not allowed to have a pet without written permission. So I said, well, this person was already contacted on that point of written permission by the management company and they are blatantly ignoring that. So I went to the law because, of course, that's the next place to look. And that's when I became invested in researching around the Dog Control Act of Trinidad and Tobago. So, contrary to popular belief, it's not called the Dangerous Dogs Act, as many people call it in common terms. It's the Dog Control Act. And again, contrary to popular belief, because so many people are so ill-informed about this act that it's astounding. And the act was, in fact, proclaimed in June of 2014. So... I mean, this is by no means a new or novel piece of legislation. This is something that has been around. But unfortunately, when I started looking for a precedent so that I could get this matter moving forward, I was, I was shocked to learn that... I found none. <laughs> well, I found none, but I was also shocked to learn from the police that they have never made any sort of warning, issued any arrest, nothing under the Dog Control Act. And then I went to the regional corporation in my area 
and they also informed me that they have never issued any license or registration or anything under the Dog Control Act. So that's when I did what any reasonable person would do, and I Googled it. <laughs> and that's how I found you, Natasha, because I saw your name on a Guardian, a Guardian newspaper web page. And, you know, not to, be, not to make this a very training pod- podcast, but me with my fast self <laughs> decided <laughs> that I would find you somehow and reach out to you. Luckily, it's not very hard to find Natasha because I just, <laughs> uh, thankfully, <laughs> I found your number on LinkedIn and that's when I asked you because, I mean, your story is also a very, I mean, it's a very touching one as well. Yeah, and it, it just, what you just explained, I didn't even know that myself, that the Dog Control Act, which, as you say, has been proclaimed since 2014, which is, what, eight years now, right? And not one not one individual or police officer or anybody has used the law in the way that I am assuming it was intended to have some control over certain breeds of dogs and to ensure that certain parameters are met by the owners of these dogs. And uh, incidentally, about three or four months ago, my neighbor who lives next door to me, the property that I rent, acquired a pit bull. I think he's a a bully, um, American bully. And this, of course, horrified me and my husband because we have cats. And there's a very low wall that separates both of our houses. So you can imagine the thoughts running through my head, right? And even, even though I understood what the parameters were in terms of what an owner is supposed to do with his his or her property when they own one of these dogs. I didn't feel empowered enough to actually report the individual to the police. I'm sure they probably would have done nothing, but we just took it upon ourselves to take our own precautions. We actually put up some lattice work over the wall so that at least he can still see through the wall, but if he decides he wants to, you know, get too friendly with any of my cats, he will have at least a barrier to go through. And I think that that speaks to the heart of the problem because, I mean, the in my scenario, the dog owner's house was not directly next door to me. Mm. However, her direct adjoining neighbor also raised their wall because it was, I mean, we, we're not going to, we're not here to be, well, I'm not here to say that these dogs are vicious and bad and horrible animals. Certainly because not. That's absolutely no. not true. I mean, they are beautiful animals and yes, and they are very strong and very, you know, they're playful and, and childlike and, and very friendly, most of them. But at the same time, that's why I think that it comes back down to why are we as in you with your lattice work or my neighbor with her raising her wall. Why is it that other people have to have the onus of responsibility placed on them when there is an entire law that clearly sets out the responsibility of the dog owner to their dog and to other people? So I think that is where I started to get very much frustrated with the law and with the police service and the regional corporation and everybody yeah yeah it, it's it's almost as if you know the the lawmakers write this legislation they pass the law it's like a, a trophy it looks like you know i did this for you guys i did this for you all and meanwhile the people who have to enforce it are none the wiser they're not educated they're not trained they're not empowered to enforce said law. No, because I was just looking back when I was preparing to speak with you and I was looking at just a basic skeleton of what the Dog Control Act allows for. And if you would just allow me a minute, is that the Dog the Dog Control Act speaks generally to the responsibility of dog owners to take care of their dog properly. 
And it also sets, sets out certain stipulations that in order to own a Class A dog, which includes pit bulls and bullies of every single kind. And of course, people say, well, my dog is a mixed breed dog. My dog is not a pit bull. My dog is a pit bull, half pit bull, half pot on. It's covered. A Class A dog is any dog that is bred from a pit bull or a bully or any of those dogs. So I always get a little amused when people try to use the defense that it's a mixed dog. So you have to register your dog. You have to get a license for your dog. You have to ensure that your premises are secured premises with certain guidelines as regulated by the law. And then there are certain offenses that are committed under this act. For example, if you are found with an unlicensed class A dog, you can be fined or even imprisoned. You have to have insurance for the dog. You cannot take the dog into certain places. You, can't, you cannot abandon your dog. You have to train the dog. You have to be liable for if the dog escapes. You have to place a notice, like a warning sign on your gate or your door or something. And I think dog owners, you know, especially when people think they have a quote unquote bad dog, they put the sign there on their gate thinking that that's scaring away people. But you need to understand that it's flipped to the dog owner. The dog owner's understanding, of course, is that you have to put that sign there because I'm sorry, if the dog attacks anybody, you are the one liable for that yep. offense. Correct. And I, I, you know, I prayed, I prayed for the day that the day would never, uh, you know, come that that I dog i don't even know his name but he's a gorgeous dog he he's generally very friendly wags his tail you know he he looks very happy and he's just a puppy i pray that the day does not come when any of my cats either of my cats comes to any harm as a result of that dog because trust me i it, i don't know what i will do <laughs> i think i i think i will I will explode and it is not again as you say it's not because of any breed shaming or anything like that you just want to know just the the fact that there is legislation is a problem is an issue for some people but the fact is we have it and if people were were educated enough as you mentioned and aware of the fact that when you own an animal regardless of the breed you have to make, make sure that it is living its best life and in, in doing so it protects others and other animals from from harm just the simple fact of you know not keeping it chained up 24 hours a day not keeping it in a kennel 24 hours a day making sure it, it goes for walks making sure that it's socialized with either other humans or other dogs these simple things contribute to what to a dog's well-being and, and happiness. And that is what you want, what you should want as a dog owner. I think so too. Because one of the um, stipulations in the Dog Control Act states that you cannot have a Class A dog in premises that accommodates more than one household. Oh. I don't know I don't know that we could have mm. been any clearer to the dog owner in our scenario that we are not telling you that it's illegal to have a dog like that in Trinidad and Tobago. We are not telling you that your dog is a bad vicious dog. We are not saying that the dog has bitten anybody or anything like that. We are not we haven't said any of those things. We said firstly it's prohibited by the lease that's the first and foremost thing and secondly the dog control act the legislative arm in trinidad and tobago acknowledged that the dog like class a dogs should not be allowed to reside in premises that have more than one household because if you have your own yard with your own fence and everything you are in control of those premises in a way larger degree than you are here in order for this dog owner to transport her dog from her car to her house she has to pass over 20 people's houses 
and she does not muzzle the dog. She does not have the dog properly restrained and people have that a well founded fear that something could go awry. Yep. Yep. There are a lot of myths that are bound about about pit bulls in particular, but also other breeds like what are the breeds? Could you share with us what the breeds are, the class A dog breeds? You have that before you. Right. So class A dogs are set out at six breeds of dogs set out in the schedule to the Dog Control Act. So the first is American Pitbull Terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier, American Bully, a Doggo Argentino, a Japanese Toza, and a Fila Brasileiro. Yes, Brasileiro. Mm-hmm. So those are the six dogs and any dog bred from. Right. That's a, sh- a relatively short list, but there are a lot of Pitbull breeds, terri- Pitbull Terrier breeds in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot. And I think what people need to understand is that this is also a very, a much wider and a, a much more global issue than people ever think of. So, of course, it's easy to think that, well, everybody in Trinidad has their dogs, just leave people in peace with their dogs, you know. But this is not an uncommon piece of legislation. Most countries around the world have a Dog Control Act, and one very common theme in all of those acts is that these six dogs are listed in all of them. I mean, I, I, I would say, okay, I haven't checked every single one, right? But for all the ones that I have checked, and in the USA alone, um, they said that bites, dog bites from pit bull dogs, account for the most children visits to the emergency room in the entire country. So, I mean, that's an interesting statistic and it really does connect back to the experience that we had because there are a lot of children living in my community. And because we are a gated community with a nice walkway and everything, children used to play and ride their bikes and scooters and whatever. And since that dog came in here, I have not seen a single child pass in front of my house playing. Of course, because no parent is going to allow their child to run free in, in a place where, you know, you, it, a, a pit bull is, is also roaming free. I mean, that's, wow. So you, so you, you came up upon a brick wall with the police, with the regional corp. Um, and with the individual, what was your next step and how did you go about achieving some resolution? Because I understand there is one. There is a resolution. However, I don't think it's the resolution that you would have wanted. So I, my first step was to make a complaint at the magistrate's court. So... I made a complaint at the magistrate's court under the Dog Control Act saying the very same thing, that the dog owner has an American Pit Bull Terrier Class A dog living in premises that accommodate more than one household. Please kindly, you know, address this issue through the parameters of this law. I, to date, no fault of the magistrate, no fault of myself or anyone have gotten absolutely nowhere at the magistrate's court. It's upsetting and disheartening because you spend time, effort, you know, you make court appearances, you organize with an attorney, everything, and you get nowhere at the magistrate's court. So the only next step that I could have thought of was that the company, the management company of my community would have to take the dog owner as well as the owner of the house to the high court for breach of the lease agreement. So while the dog control issue was not addressed, all of the well-founded fears about the breed of the dog and about the proximity of the dog to other people and the lazy fair attitude taken by the dog owner was very well expressed to the, the high court 
and our judge it was um the honorable justice madam nadia kangaloo she was not hesitant towards making an injunction so she granted us an injunction which stipulated that the dog has to be removed among other things because of course our issue is narrow for the purposes of today in terms of just speaking about the dog but after our initial contact with the dog owner i mean the hostility was unprecedented um it resulted in or oh, i mean it resulted in her putting surveillance cameras face at our houses she was posting it on facebook i mean all of that was of course in the court proceedings but in terms of the dog itself um one of the reliefs that we asked for was that well for some background in the lease agreement you are obviously i'm sure your lease agreement says the same thing is that you are prohibited from using the premises for illegal purposes so in one in our relief we asked that the stop using the premises for illegal purposes by harboring an illegal animal pursuant to the dog control act and the judge granted that relief so i mean of course we have not had a trial so i am not going to definitively say you know anything about that but i mean just that action alone tells you that the dog control act is very much in effect and that having the dog there in prohibited spaces is an illegal offense yep precisely and it, it's a shame that you had to go all the way to the high court because i'm sure that requires some financial resources that you may you weren't prepared to expand i'm sure on this matter but it is such a it's a basic quality of life issue to me and the fact that the the company that that manages the compound was willing to to take legal action on behalf of its residents is is commendable as well well i mean there were there were many residents that expressed their grievances about the dog's presence on the compound but you know there were also very many people who were they, they did not want to oppose a neighbor and i think that this is very much in keeping with the culture of Trinidad you know where people tend to you know you'll gripe about something to everybody else but to the person who you have the issue with you'll be like oh no it's no problem it's okay you're good don't worry <laughs> yep correct <laughs> correct and i think that that has to do with i just did think the fear of you know retaliation or or something else like that because the crime rate is is really um putting a lot of people back in a shell in terms of um uh, voicing their opinions and and how they feel about things and you know we we often expect a more um probably a violent you know result and that should that shouldn't be i mean if someone raises a genuine concern with you we would think that any reasonable human being would respond in in kind you know you would hope so and i mean of course this is more towards the legal end of what happened but even after receiving the order the for injunctive relief against the dog owner the dog owner did not comply with the court order for over 24 days we were made to go back to the court for contempt proceedings against the dog owner and it was only on the day it it really i mean the person really pushed it to the very very end and refused at all accounts to see reason in the matter and of course you know we were forced we we had to go back make another application for contempt of court to tell the court this person has not complied with the court order and is refusing to do so and um on the day of the contempt hearing the judge made an order that the person had 48 hours to remove the dog among other things barring which 
at the expiration of the 48 hours, she will be sentenced to seven days in Golden Grove Prison. And I think at that point was the only point that reality really struck a chord with the dog owner. Because instead of just being a reasonable person, instead of moving the dog and all the other things, the person just chose to move out the very same day. So that's how the matter concluded with us not having the dog around. But I mean, why did it have to get to that is why what we keep asking ourselves. <laughs> Precisely, precisely. And I, and it's instructive that only the threat of, of prison time, you know, spurred, spurred the individual to action. And of course, I mean, you have to look at it in this way too, is that we did not get this relief under the Dog Control Act. We got this relief under your basic breach of contract law. And I think that that is wrong because, I mean, we were never asking this individual for, for us to seize the dog or, you know, for her to put the dog in the pound or anything like that, you know. We were just simply saying, you did not have the dog all along. You know, it's a new dog that you acquired, but you should have known that you, should, you shouldn't have reasonably expected that the dog could live in premises like this. You don't live in a house by yourself, so you can't expect the same freedoms that you would have in a place like that as opposed to here. But of course, I mean, you know, some people don't see things in the eyes of others. They only see it through their own lenses. And um, something that the dog owner persistently said was that we, as in the residents, have made a determination about a dog that we've never had any experience with, that we've never met, we've never interacted with in any way. But my, um, I mean, of course it's not a response, but like my thought process on that is that it simply doesn't matter. Your dog could be the nicest dog for 20 years, but we live alongside the main road. If for whatever reason your dog is outside living in peace and harmony with everybody and a big truck is passing and lets off that air horn, if something in your dog <laughs> triggers off, it will be no fault of ours or yours, but you will be the one liable at the end of the day. And because this community is controlled by a company, if somebody gets seriously injured or worse, were killed in the process, they are also going to be suing the company. So the risk, like if we have to balance it, <laughs> you know, the risk to us is way higher than you saying that we are discriminated against the breed of your dog. I'm sorry that the breed of your dog is being discriminated against. However, when you do the public interest and safety and all the other considerations, I mean, it just doesn't level up. Correct. And the fact that there is a law against this class of dog should say all you need to know. So it, it really is incumbent upon um, persons who want to have these dogs in their possession or to be guardians as, as, the, as some um, animal welfare activists call it. They, they don't refer to animals as, as being owned but being um, taken care of, right? So if you choose to, to own slash be the guardian of an animal, you need to know what you need to do because at the end of the day, the dog is not liable for anything. You are. The dog could do whatever it wants. It may it may end in a you know in an untimely and unfortunate demise for the dog, depending on what they do. But at the end of the day, you the human still have to take responsibility for what the dog does or may or may not do. And that's why the law is in and, place. And I think it also ties in very nicely with animal rights in general, because you have that moral right and that legal right that is afforded to your dog, which is a non-human animal, and they deserve that basic entitlement. And I mean, just on a general basis that an animal can suffer and they can experience suffering. 
humans have that inherent moral obligation to minimize and avoid that suffering insofar as possible. So I think that you also have to have some degree of respect for your animal in these types of situations. So because your animal has advanced cognitive ability and everything, you shouldn't place them in harm's way. If this, if the dog owner in our scenario didn't choose to leave and didn't choose to put her dog in a safe home or give the dog to one of her friends that has their own yard or something, then, you know, it would have faced a grim outcome, which is not what we wanted, which is not what I believe anybody wants. I mean, I hate seeing those stories where the police shot a dog and, you know, the dog was impounded and kept under harsh conditions. That should be avoided at all costs, but the responsibility rests with the dog owner. Of course, all those cases where people poison animals, I mean, that is the... The worst way, the most painful way to die, and nobody wants to, I mean, those of us who hate to see that, nobody wants that to happen to any dog or cat no. or any animal. And and that could have been the end result for her dog, so she really didn't have much concern for his or her, I don't know if it was a he or she, <laughs> welfare and, and well-being in that instance. So are you satisfied with the outcome? I mean... You no longer have to, to deal with that threat. I think so. I mean, I think it is an out of sight, out of mind situation for all of the residents here. Um, me in particular, I think that, I mean, I have no idea where the dog is now. I don't know the current living state or anything like that. But all I can say is that I hope that wherever the dog has ended up now, that it will be in better circumstances than it would have ever been in if it continued to live here. And I also hope that this would stand as a good learning experience for the dog owner and any dog owner that if you own a certain breed of dog, please know your responsibilities and know what is expected of you and also have respect for other people's op op opposing views. Just because they don't see the dog as this loving, cute, fluffy toy animal. Don't get offended by that in the same way that this person is not going to be offended that you love yep. the dog. Precisely. So no precedent was set in this case as regards the Dog Control Act, unfortunately. No. So we are still in the magistrate's court to deal with this very issue of the Dog Control Act. However, I genuinely cannot speak to when that will be resolved because it's just been a very stagnated process going through the magistrate's court which is very unfortunate very unfortunate for everyone because i do believe that if one person get the ball rolling and gets a precedent then it will sort of maybe gear the dog owners towards the direction of complying with the law as opposed to just oh well what you'll do to me the police can't do anything precisely I agreed fully agreed um somebody has to um to be brave enough i guess and to and the people who are uh, appointed and and imbued with the authority to enforce laws or you do it now i mean police please i mean we i've heard enough complaints about police when it comes to animal cruelty issues that are brought before them and this is just another form of uh, you know animal welfare another animal welfare issue that is not taken seriously by law enforcement is not taken seriously clearly by by the courts and it's up to us as citizens to, to raise our voices and do what we can to, um, to to push the ball along and to get it going because um you know and this is this is what I am trying to do with this podcast and you know I'm sure and there are many other people who are really um, on the nose and really aware but we have to we have to begin to, to share more education and 
awareness about animal welfare issues across the board. I wholeheartedly agree. And what I would add to that is that um, the dog, dog owners need to stop viewing the Dog Control Act as something that is against them. If you, as a dog owner, follow these, the guidelines that, that are set out in that law, in terms of getting your dog registered and licensed and all of those things, your dog themselves will be afforded the, re- the required protection. And as a dog owner, like that is your responsibility to the animal themselves. So I think instead of seeing it as, oh, these people out for me and they out for my dog, nobody out for your dog and <laughs> nobody out for you. People just want some sort of predictability. And if there is a guideline that is set out, why not? Why not follow it? That's simple. You have anything else you wanted to share with us, Amy, about um, maybe what are your plans? And if you do you plan to get a dog or rescue a dog, <laughs> what are your <laughs> animal animal plans for the future? As in in light of of this this whole matter. Well. I would have started out by telling you about my dog that we had for 10 years, so me and my two sisters. And after experiencing that very dark time when my dog was poisoned by a frog. So if anybody else has ever experienced that, I'm sure you know how traumatic yeah, that is. I do. And um, I do, I do. And I just don't know right now even though it has been four years i just don't know that i could open my heart in that way because i I find animals to be so transient you know you just feel like a different level yeah it's like we don't deserve them we don't deserve them and i just feel like if i don't know that i could um even begin to go through the the hoot of that ever again. I mean, it was so bad. I saw one of my friends bought a puppy for their five-year-old. And I said, oh my goodness, they just bought them a heartbreak, <laughs> one very big heartbreak in the next 12 years. Oh. But, <laughs> I mean, that's just me. I've just yeah, taken a very yeah. well, take it from me. I Here's this little piece of advice. There is a dog out there somewhere, a rescue, who needs someone like you to be their guardian for the time that they're on this planet. I guess that is the, the moral um, question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dan, there are lo- there's so many beautiful, loving rescues out there um, who who will fill that, that void in your heart right now, believe me. Well, I don't know when that day will come, but <laughs> I will keep my mind open to it. <laughs> Please do. And when you do, let us know here on Animalia. Amy Khan, thank you so much for talking with us. And we will continue to advocate for, for on behalf of animals and in the hope that our law enforcement will catch up with the legislation that is already on the books and that everyone will fall in line and and do what is right for humans and animals well natasha thank you very very much for having me and thank you very much for taking a call from a stranger all those months ago because i really do appreciate the the very serendipitous friendship that has resulted from that call Well, I was absolutely blown away by the outcome of Amy's story because it confirmed a lot of what we already knew, that animal welfare legislation is trumpeted as being a solution to the problems animals face in Trinidad and Tobago, but are largely unused because adequate regulation and education doesn't form part of its proclamation, that those empowered by the state to enforce the law are unwilling to do so that citizens themselves who break the law are not conscious enough to do the right thing and take responsibility for their actions, that one has to be supremely committed and have the resources to follow through 
on legal action, and that we are yet to have legal precedent of a matter brought before the court under the Dog Control Act, which is eight years old now. This is indeed a travesty, and the blame, I have to say, falls squarely on the shoulders of our lawmakers, for they have been elected to serve the people and, as such, have the power and responsibility to make law that is meaningful, accessible, and enforceable. A doggy is nothing if he don't have a bone Or doggy hold your bone hey! A doggy is nothing if he don't have a bone Or doggy hold your bone And that's the end of episode 4 I hope you enjoyed it And you'll be back in 2 weeks to hear from another amazing person doing their part to advance the cause of animal welfare. Remember to check out the website animaliathepod.com for new episodes, archived episodes, and much more. Search and subscribe to Animalia the Pod on your favorite podcast platform, whether it's iTunes, SoundCloud, or even YouTube for new episodes. You should also like and follow Animalia the Pod on Facebook and Instagram. And if you'd like to appear on the podcast, send an email to animaliathepod at gmail.com. I'm Natasha, and until next time, take good care and remember, love off your pets. Bye-bye.